657 CE, the Battle of Siffin takes place between Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph of Islam and the governor of Syria, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. At the site of imminent defeat, the Syrian called for arbitration, which Ali agrees to, resulting in the formation of what is known as the Kharjites, a group which opposed Ali for agreeing to the arbitration or tahkim, which suited the Syrians more than Ali. An important point which merits a highlight here is that the Kharjites had declared Muawiya as a rebel and a grave sinner and therefore according to the Quran must be dealt with. The same rebels however then declared Ali to be a grave sinner for not being heavy handed enough when they were close to victory which to them qualified him for a death sentence. The underlying philosophy at work here was about the question of what is a grave sinner and whether a grave sinner should be considered a believer or a non-believer which ultimately dictated their extreme actions. Initial Islamic philosophy actually straddled across speculative theology and philosophy. The combination of the two is known as Kalam or dialectical theology. Now, Kalam cannot be separated from Islamic philosophy. At the end of the day, the debates were all philosophical in nature. The earliest theological disputes in Muslim antiquity were primarily centered around the concept of free will and predestination or Qadr. During the reign of Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik, a certain individual named Ghailan ibn Muslim was proving to be too much of a nuisance. He was a Qadri or the proponent of the idea that man is free and possesses capability to act. He is therefore the author of all his actions, good or bad. He wasn't the first one who came up with this idea, however, he was in fact a disciple of another Qadri theologian, Ma'bad ibn Khalid al-Juhni. In their argument for human free will, they even went to the extent of denying that God has any foreknowledge regarding whether a person will be rightly guided or misguided in this world, as God was being taken out of the picture completely. The Umayyads, in order to legitimize their actions both good and especially bad, however, were more inclined towards the opposing school of thought, the Jabris, to whom human actions are 100% preordained by God, and as a consequence, the Caliph is only doing what God has willed. Therefore, a complete exoneration of their evil deeds was implied. Now, Ghailan and Ma'bud were having none of it, and neither was the Caliph Abdul Malik, so naturally, both Ma'bud and Ghailan were executed. Now, when this question, what is a grave sinner and whether a grave sinner should be considered a believer or a non-believer, was raised in academic circles of the great ascetic Al-Hasan al-Basri, one of his disciples, Wasil ibn Atta, deferred with his teacher and opined that the grave sinner was neither a believer nor an unbeliever, but having an intermediate position as a sinner. Or fasik. Consequently, Wasil left his teacher's study circle. So, Alasan al Basri declared, Wasil itzillana. That is, Wasil withdrew from us. Itzilla is the root word for Mu'tazila, which means those who withdraw and stand apart. Interestingly enough, the Mu'tazila never called themselves by that name. In fact, they were self proclaimed Ahl Tawheed wal Adil, which can be translated to people of monotheism and justice. For Wasil ibn Atta, human freedom is a necessary requirement of divine justice. Reason and revelation should work in harmony according to the Mu'tazila and scripture should be interpreted based on reason. According to Islamic principles agreed upon during the period of the Prophet and his companions and the following generations, the sources of knowledge and evidence are four and importantly in, in the following prioritization. Quran comes first, then Sunnah, then Ijma or consensus and then finally Qiyas or analogy. Now, the Mu'tazila agreed to that. They just changed the order around. Proving from reason was at the forefront of any inquiry, be it regarding any of the natural science or scriptural interpretation. Then comes Quran, followed by Sunnah and ultimately Ijma or consensus. They justified their stance by arguing that through reason alone we can understand the Quran and Sunnah are the revealed sources. In the absence of reasoning, one cannot differentiate between good and bad. 762 CE, the city of Baghdad was founded by Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur and since Jundishapur was close to Baghdad, the Persians were always in a close political contact with the Abbasids and it was from this school of Jundishapur that major and the most significant technological and scientific progress was brought and spread to the rest of the Islamic world. However, nothing could be as massively instrumental 
for both the rise of Islamic golden age and eventually for the renaissance in the West as a translation movement, an undertaking that would definitively alter the course of history. In a rather interesting blunder for the ages, the last three books of Eniat, along with some other works by Plotinus, were translated by a man named Abdul Masih ibn Naima and were erroneously attributed to Aristotle, inadvertently laying the foundations of Muslim Neoplatonism. For years and years to come, stalwarts such as Al-Kindi and Ibn Sina and Farabi just took it as the work of the first master Aristotle and never asked a damn question. Now, Mu'tazila were a bunch of extremely smart individuals. They knew important people, and they knew people who knew important people. Amr ibn Ubaid, for example, was a Mu'tazila scholar who was his close friend of Abu Jafar al-Mansur even before he became the caliph. So they were liberties Mu'tazila scholar could afford to take in spreading their ideology, and boy, did they do that to great effect. Even the caliph Harun al-Rashid had Mu'tazila scholars strolling about in his court. The Mu'tazila heyday, however, came when Caliph al-Mamun ascended to the position of Caliph in the year 813. New friendships were formed and Mu'tazila became the dominant scholastic force in the Caliph's court. There was a Mu'tazila judge. Influential positions in government were occupied by them. Uh, the fatwas were issued by their scholars and Caliph al-Mamun himself embraced Mu'tazilite ideology. Mu'tazilaism became the state-sponsored school of thought with the Caliph as its patron in chief. During this period, the issue of Quran status had reached its crucial stage. From the very beginning, the Mu'tazila negated attributes of God and therefore, according to their logic, Quran is not eternal but created by God. While Sunni Muslims altogether believe that the Quran is a word of God, not its creation and hence eternal. Caliph al-Mamun himself was so invested in the idea that Quran is created that he opted for violence against whoever disagreed with him or the Mu'tazila ideology. Government employees, scholars, soldiers and even regular folks were subjected to torture and were made jobless if they did not adhere. One particular force of nature of the time, however, could not be bent. No amount of torture, flogging or imprisonment could break him. That force of nature was the Usuli scholar Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He was put in chains and thrown behind bars during the time of al-Mamun for disagreeing with the state narrative. However, it was Caliph al mutasim who had subjected him to grave torture. His consistent and resolute resistance, however, rallied those who opposed the Mu'tazilites with resolve and determination. They were many, many victims of the state persecution. The Inquisition lasted for 14 years. Mu'tazila were to remain the dominant force during the rules of three caliphs, al-Mamun, al-Mu'tasim, and al-Wasiq, Caliph al-Mutawakkil in 847 CE, put an end to the state backing of Mu'tazila and allowed the scholars to freely discuss issues according to the Sunni principles. A new dominant theological school arose as a result, however, the Asherites started to gain popular support and it was Mu'tazila's turn to face the music now. They were the ones being jailed and punished. One of those who bore the brunt of Caliph's wrath was a certain man named Abu Yusuf. Yaqub who was also the tutor to Ahmad, Caliph al mutasims son. As he fell from favor, his huge personal library was confiscated and distributed among his adversaries. Abu Yusuf Yaqub is more famously known as Al-Kindi. According to some sources, Al-Kindi was born in Basra, while others suggest that he was born in Kufa, towards the end of or beginning of the 9th century. His father was the governor of the city of Kufa. After moving to Baghdad in 814 CE, the bright and young Al-Kindi soon attracted the attention of Al-Mamun, who appointed him a translator at Beitul Hikmah. Here Al-Kindi came into contact with the towering figures such as the likes of Ibn Hayyan, the inventor of science of chemistry and the mathematician Al-Khwarizmi, the inventor of algebra. He enjoyed the patronage of Caliph al-Mamun and then later on continued with Caliph al-Mutasim and al wasiq Al-Kindi is regarded as the first true philosopher of the Islamic world, however it's a bit more complicated than that. After all, Muslim scholars, or theologians, Mutakallimeen and the Sufis had been benefiting with philosophy in their writings and teachings even before Al-Kindi's time. What is true, however, is that Al-Kindi is definitely the first philosopher to introduce the works of the Peripatetic school, that is the school of Aristotle, in an attempt to integrate philosophy within the Muslim framework. In the Arab world at the time, philosophy was seen as something foreign, something imported 
came from outside and was being imposed on Arabs. Al-Kindi tried to demonstrate that Greek philosophy isn't something to be dispensed with, but rather something that should be utilized as a tool to better understand the scripture. Because it is the scripture itself that urges the Muslims to reflect and use their intellect in the Quran says and ponder on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Additionally, Al-Kindi put forward the following reasons for incorporating philosophy into the Muslim thought. He said philosophy and religion both concern themselves with a common subject, which is the comprehension of the fundamental truths of existence. These truths encompass the knowledge of God, his oneness and all things virtuous, and indeed this is the essence of religious inquiry. The shared objective of both philosophy and religion is the pursuit of truth and the application of that truth in one's life. Ultimately, whether through philosophy or religion, individuals are expected to cultivate virtue. Aristotelian impact is evident in specific aspects of Al-Kindi's thought, such as the concept of four causes. Nevertheless, Al-Kindi adheres to Aristotelian principles only to a certain extent, the point at which the path diverge is in their respective views on the origin of the world. Aristotle advocates the eternity of the world, whereas Al-Kindi puts forward the idea of creation out of nothing or creation ex nihilo. In defense of Greek philosophy, he says, oh, we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or to acquire it from wherever it comes, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign people. There is, for the student of truth, nothing more important than the truth, nor is the truth demeaned or diminished by the one who states or conveys it. No one is demeaned by the truth, rather all are ennobled by it. He asked the question whether the study of philosophy is necessary or not. If it is indeed necessary, then we have no choice but to study it. And if it isn't necessary, then we have to justify this claim with reason and demonstration, which of course are functions of philosophy. So there is no escape but to be well-versed with philosophy according to Al-Kindi. Despite being a proponent of philosophy, Al-Kindi never negates the divine knowledge of the prophets. He believed that it is a kind of knowledge which does not require effort and is revealed to the prophets directly, albeit with divine assistance. Al-Kindi is notable for his work in philosophical terminology and for developing a vocabulary for philosophical thought in Arabic which did not exist prior to him. Al-Kindi not only was the first to bridge the gap between philosophy and faith in Islam, but also paved the way for it to be applied to all Abrahamic religions. When the fates turned for Mu'tazila, Al-Kindi also became a victim, but somehow survived the onslaught. During his last days, he developed an infection in his knee. To alleviate the pain, he used to drink aged wine, and every time he had to do it, he repented, until he substituted wine with honey that, however, did not help, and the infection spread. Al-Kindi passed away in age 66 CE. Now, every theology ultimately has or requires a literalist mode of understanding of scripture. So when it comes to Islam, it is worth mentioning a certain individual named Dawud al-Zahiri, who had pretty much founded his own madhab or school of thought, you know, school of thought similar to Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali. Unlike the other schools of thought, the Zahiris largely rejected the idea of analogical reasoning or qayas, or what is known as istihsan, or juristic discretion. They argued that all the problems of interpretation and the conflicts arising from those interpretations of the scripture would cease to exist if everybody just focused on the outward meaning of the scripture. The spirit of inquiry which Al-Kindi instigated, which never compromised on the tenets of Islam, nevertheless left far-reaching consequences, especially, fatally, for the ones who pushed the limits too far. One of his disciples, Ahmad ibn Tayyib al-Sarakhshi, is one such example, a close friend of Caliph al-Mu'tadid. Or so he thought, at least. Al-Sarakhshi often went far and beyond in expressing his heretic ideas to the Caliph. Some accounts mention that he also wrote books calling the prophets charlatans. It reached a point where the Caliph was forced to pause and analyze what the heck is this guy on about. The Caliph ultimately was like, yo, enough is enough, you're a dead man. And so he was dead by way of execution on account of heresy. Abu Hassan al-Ravandi also comes to mind as someone who allowed himself to be flattened by this newly discovered philosophical blitzkrieg. He denounced the whole fabric of revelation as superfluous. He's like, mm, why don't we just dispense with the whole 
business of revelation and the prophets all together human reason is enough to know god and to determine right from wrong and the whole enterprise of miracles upon which the claims of prophecy are supposedly rested were utterly absurd he himself was of persian heritage so quran being a literary miracle was also untenable since muhammad's proficiency of arabic language is only miraculous for arabic speakers what about other languages he also found laughable the idea that angels assisted in battle of badr why didn't the angels descend during the battle of uhud when clear Really, Muslims could have used some help there too, you know. Although Ibn Rawandi was widely known for his audacious and daring intellectual expression, he is overshadowed in the annals of free inquiry in Islam by a considerably more eminent contemporary, a Persian compatriot, Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Zakaria al-Razi. Al-Razi, undeniably the most renowned non-conformist in the entire history of Islam. He was also celebrated as the foremost medical authority of the 10th century. His straight-out heretic philosophy is quite shocking as well. Pretty much denied Quran as being perfect, pointed out contradictions in it, believed that God may exist perhaps, but did not believe in the prophethood of Muhammad. Al-Kindi had famously ascribed to the idea of creation ex nihilo, which Al-Razi rejected. He said, how can God create the universe which has time in it without being subjected to time himself? God chose to create the universe at some point in time, at some specific moment. So time must already exist. Also, what did God create the universe out of? There's got to be stuff present prior to him to make the universe out of. And if there was no space present prior to the act of creation, where was the universe placed inside? There's got to be a container for the universe, right? So where did that come from? And matter itself cannot be created since that would give us an infinite regress. God would have to create the matter out of something else that is out of some other kind of matter which itself would have to be created out of something else and so on. In a recording of a debate held, one historic figure who was established to be hostile towards Al-Razi was another man from Ray also named Al-Razi. Abu Hatim Al-Razi was an Ismaili scholar who mostly addressed Al-Razi as Abu Bakr Al-Razi the heretic. Through this record we come to know about two books that Al-Razi had allegedly written. One of the books was called On Tricks of False Prophets and the other one was called On Prophecies. But so are a number of other titles attributed to Al-Razi which are pro-religion and prophecy so it's not as straightforward as it might seem. Al-Razi's views were later criticized by Ibn Sina. Being a physician himself, he had said, Al-Razi who meddles in metaphysics and exceeds his competence. He should have remained confined to surgery and to urine and stool testing. Indeed, he exposed himself and showed his ignorance in these matters. Ibn Sina, more like savage Sina, it is said that he practiced alchemy in addition to medicine and towards the end of his life developed a cataract which he refused to have removed because as he said he had seen enough of the world and did not want to see any more. He died in 925 or 935 according to different sources. Saif Dola, the emir of the Amdani dynasty of Aleppo was busy doing his emir thing. The court was in order and he was having a conversation with other scholars. A mysterious sheikh in tattered clothes walked in. The emir spoke to the scholars in a language which he was sure nobody but them understood. This sheikh looks weird. I'm going to ask him a couple of questions and if he's unable to answer, burn him. The weird sheikh suddenly said in the same language, O oh, ruler, be patient because an affair is determined by its consequences. Emir Saif Dola was left speechless. He asked, you know this language? The sheikh replied, yes, I speak more than 70 languages. Impressed by sheikh's talent, the Umir hired him as his senior consultant. That sheikh happened to be, you know, the father of Islamic Neoplatonism, famously known as the second master, the first being Aristotle himself. His name was Sheikh Abu Nasser Muhammad Al-Farabi. It is important to go back in history and understand the childhood of Al-Farabi, which we know nothing about except that he was born in Farab. That doesn't help at all because we don't know where Farab was or is. Kazakhstan has Al-Farabi on their currency note, so they claim him. Yeah, nice try. Borat is still the most famous Kazakh out there. He's known to have moved from Baghdad at the age of 40. He also spent time in Aleppo and Damascus. 
Al-Farabi wrote treatises on metaphysics, cosmology, human nature, ethics, and significantly on political philosophy. He is also known for his landmark book on music. His metaphysics was entirely based on Plotinus' theory of emanation. But his rendition was of course more aligned with the Islamic teachings. Neoplatonism was an attribute to Plotinus as discussed in the beginning, but in fact it was thought to be the work of the first master, Aristotle. Al-Farabi made groundbreaking contributions to political philosophy as well, particularly in formulating the earliest and the most comprehensive social contract theory. While he was not the originator of this concept nor the final contributor, however, in what can only be deemed intellectual dishonesty, the West has overlooked his genius and subsequent social contract theories such as Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau often take more prominent positions in such discussions. Man is inherently a creature who possesses reason as well as the power of contention, says Al-Farabi. It is due to this second property that human beings are always susceptible to chaos and unrest. Therefore, the following reasons give rise to the formation of states. The most powerful of the lot is able to subjugate the people and conquer a territory. A state can be formed based on heredity as the ones who are deemed qualified just by the virtue of belonging to a certain lineage. A bunch of people may come together sharing the same economical objectives and form a state. A bunch of people may come together to safeguard their rights can also create a state. This last type of state is what Al-Farabi calls the ideal state, and this is the state formed based on the principles of social contract. Everyone collectively and voluntarily surrender some of their freedoms and submit them to the authority of a chosen sovereign. The social contract can never be forced in exchange for protection of their rights and for the maintenance of social order. Saif ad remained a lifelong patron of this weird sheikh who walked into his court that one day. Al-Farabi passed away in 951 in Damascus. Muslim thinkers, theologians and philosophers had one job, to agree with or disagree with the first master Aristotle, until this man came along. Muslim thinkers, theologians and philosophers still had one job, to agree with or disagree with al Sheikh al-Rais Abu Ali al Hussein ibn Sina. Phenomenal at so many things such as medicine and philosophy, theology, logic, mathematics, physics, music. But perhaps being modest was not one of them. And who could blame him, to be fair? It is hard to stay humble when you're that good. Born in the year 980 in a village near Bukhara to a Persian family, by the age of 10 he informs us in his autobiography, I had completed the study of Quran and major part of Arabic literature or other. His genius was as such that people wondered at his attainments and soon his teacher al Natili found himself unable to match Avicenna's mastery of logic. From logic he turned to the study of physics and medicine entirely on his own, like without Google. By the age of 18 he tells us that he had mastered logic, physics and mathematics and was twirling his fingers. He turned to metaphysics next. Having read Aristotle's metaphysics 40 times, he admits it passed over his head until he stumbled upon a copy of Al-Farabi's intentions of Aristotle's metaphysics, which at once, he tells us, illuminated him Aristotle's meaning. What is a dragon? A giant winged reptile that breathes fire? But does it exist? That's an entirely different question. See, the whatness of something, which is also known as quiddity, or in Arabic mahiya, is certainly different from being. Being or wujud is an actualization of an essence. Now, dragons do not exist, as far as I'm informed. They could, but they don't. Existence is not a property of a dragon's essence. A round square, however, does not exist, because it cannot exist. It's impossible. You cannot be a circle, but identify as a square. You know what I mean? Things around us could easily not exist, but they do exist. So what is it that brings them into existence? Aristotle considered existence to be a part of the essence. In an epic departure from this Aristotelian concept, Ibn Sina argues that existence is merely an accident or something that happens to an essence but isn't part of it. Everything that exists in the world is in fact contingent or what Ibn Sina calls al-mumkin. Everything that we can imagine is also contingent. 
we just need somebody or something to bring them into existence. These things and objects and forces are neither necessary nor impossible. Cats exist, but dragons don't. Both could easily exist, but one of them does and the other doesn't. So there's got to be a necessary being or vajib al-wujud that must necessarily exist through which all the contingent beings derive their existence from. This necessary being's essence must guarantee its existence. His essence is his existence. This necessary being, the cause of all causes, is of course God. Ibn Sina's God is eternal and necessary. However, the emanation of the universe from God is also eternal and necessary. The universe, in his view, depends on God as the source of his existence, but it is not created out of nothing at a specific point in time. That is, for Ibn Sina, creation ex nihilo is unacceptable. God, says Ibn Sina, is wajibul wujud bizati, or necessarily existent in itself. Whereas the universe is vajibal wujud bil ghairihi, or necessarily existent through another. There is a type of knowledge that man possesses innately, however, which does not require sensory inputs. That is the knowledge of his own existence. And this knowledge is only possible if there exists a duality within him, the duality of body and soul. His famous floating man experiment demonstrates just that. Ibn Sina in his philosophical work Kitab al-Shifa, the Book of Healing, urges us to imagine a person who has suddenly come into existence, suspended in an empty space with no sensory experiences, no connection to the external world, including no sensory input, no spatial orientation, and no bodily sensations, and no previous knowledge of the world as well. In this thought experiment, this person is floating in a featureless, sense-deprived void. Avicenna's argument proceeds as follows. Even in this sensory deprived state, the person would still know that they exist. This awareness of existence is immediate and certain. The person cannot doubt their existence because doubt itself presupposes the existence of a thinking subject. Therefore, the existence of the self or the soul can be known independently of sensory experiences in the external world. As far as God's knowledge is concerned, which is a very critical part of Muslim thought, Ibn Sina believes that God possesses the knowledge of particulars but in a universal way. He does not specifically stop dragons from existing but just does not have dragons as a species in his providential plan. He does not go into the nitty gritty of what exists and what does not. God is perfect and therefore does not change. But in order for him to know for example that I woke up in the morning and then brushed my teeth, he first knew that I woke up and then his knowledge about me changed to knowing that I brushed my teeth. Change took place in his knowledge, therefore his perfection is compromised according to Ibn Sina. God knows about the consequences of something based on its causes. Like he knows that an eclipse will take place based on the position of the heavenly bodies. Ibn Sina passed away in the city of Hamdan in Iran in the year 1037. Some say he drank a lot and his indulgences were heedless and ultimately got the better of him. Some called him arrogant. Some accused him of heresy and even declared him an unbeliever. But importantly for us, he called himself a devout Muslim. And by the looks of it, he really did try. As the ink of his profound thoughts settled on the parchment of time, his impact left centuries to come with no choice but to grapple with the echoes of his brilliant thought. The 10th century saw the Muslim empire expand and naturally cracks began to appear. The empire no longer had one caliph who ran the show, but many small territorial principalities governed by various leaders. During roughly the same era, the Boyids were ruling over Iraq and Iran, balancing the Sunni prowess with their own Shia might. It was during their rule that a secret society, an esoteric Sufi order arose. This group of medieval Arab scholars called themselves the Brethren of Purity or Ikhwan al-Safa. Described as an obscure puzzle and a padlocked treasure, their legacy is comprised of 52 epistles or rasail containing encyclopedic writings on topics ranging from numerology, mathematics, minerals, botany, embryology, philosophy, theology, and magic. Yes, magic. Nobody knows who authored it, nobody knows exactly when it was written or how long did it take to write. All we can establish barring conjecture is that it was written by a group of philosophers who lived somewhere 
in or near Basra, met every 12th day in secrecy and discussed epic stuff. The creed of the Brethren of Purity, where it is stated that brethren are a group of fellow truth seekers who are held together by their contempt for the world and its allurements and their devotion to truth. Whatever its origin and theology or the divine science is their primary concern. The motto of the brethren, to shun no science, scorn any book, or to cling fanatically to any single creed, for their own creed encompasses all the other and comprehends all the sciences generally. This creed is a consideration of all existing things, both sensible and intelligible from beginning to end, whether hidden or overt, manifest or obscure, insofar as they all derived from a single principle, a single cause, a single world, and a single soul. In line with their motto, the brethren did not differentiate one form of knowledge from the other. Knowledge to them was virtuous no matter what kind. So their philosophy comprised of ideas from everywhere. Kabbalah, Christian mysticism, Hindu scriptures, pagan rituals, and everything in between. All prophets and their scriptures ultimately guide humanity to a common destination, with variations arising from the diverse temperaments of individual souls. Then of course, they have a section dedicated to magic, where they document initiation ceremonies, sacrificial rituals, and other cool stuff. In the Brethren's worldview, magic was not categorically condemned, but rather its legitimacy depended on the intentions and consequences behind its practice. They recognized that certain mystical practices often associated with what is commonly understood as magic could lead to a deeper understanding of the divine and the cosmos. The key according to the Brethren lay in the practitioner's ethical motivations and adherence to the divine order. The towering figures such as Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi often eclipse some of the other important names from the Islamic Golden Age. Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi, for example, comes to mind, a 10th century intellectual who is often neglected. Abu Yaqub al-Sijistani was a 10th century intellectual also who contributed a lot in the Ismaili Neoplatonism. Ibn Miskaway, who is known for his works in the fields of ethics. And of course, Yahya ibn Adi, a Christian Syriac philosopher whose monumental efforts during the translation movement cannot be forgotten. Things had started to go too far. From challenging dogma by rationalism, it started to tip the other way. The other way being all over the place. After the reversal of fortunes for the Mu'tazila by Imam Humble's resistance and Al-Mutawakkal's assistance, things started to get balanced a bit. The more substantial pushback against the Mu'tazila came from a gentleman named Abu Hassan Al-Ashiri. who, by the way, was a disciple of Ibn Jubai, the head of Mu'tazila Basra chapter. Abu Hassan, after growing dissatisfaction with the whole Mu'tazila enterprise, calls his teacher Ibn Jubai out for a duel, an intellectual duel, that is, a debate in which he decimates his teacher, establishes the intellectual superiority of God's ultimate omnipotence and his unrestrained, unbeholden sovereignty to do what he desires. The man can do nothing but bow his head to that. Abu Hassan went into a brief seclusion after that, during which, according to him, the Prophet appeared in his dream and told him to take charge of the Muslim community. Abu Hassan climbed the pulpit of the Mosque of Basra and retracted his Mu'tazila beliefs and vote to expose them as well. Here's a summary of key aspects of Asharism. God's attributes are real and exist independently of created things. However, they cannot be fully comprehended by human beings. God's attributes or sifat are not considered identical to his essence or zat. They rejected the notion of God having human-like qualities of what is known as anthropomorphism. They affirmed the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. They are often associated with theological determinism. They believe that everything that happens in the world, including human choices and actions, is predestined by God's divine decree. However, they also acknowledge that human beings have free will within the constraints of God's divine will. Man acquires a credit or discredit for the deeds created by God, since it is impossible that God should acquire it in time. While he is its author eternally, man as the locus or bearer of acquired actions becomes responsible for such actions. Whereas for involuntary actions such as trembling or falling, he is totally irresponsible. According to Abu Hassan al-Rashiri, the position of the early traditionalists such as Malik ibn Anas is the correct position, who is reported to have argued in the matter of God's sitting upon the throne that the sitting is known whereas its mode 
is unknown. Belief in its truth is a duty and its questioning a heresy. There is a story about an Ashari scholar and it goes like this. One day he was coming back home from the madrasa and a robber intercepted him and took away all his books. He implored to give the books back as they contained years worth of knowledge that he has learned. The robber said, what kind of knowledge is it which is inside these books and you will lose if these books are gone. The Ashuri scholar, however, convinced the robber to return the books but then decided to commit everything he learns to memory from then on. While he was living the life of being a complete rock star, delivering dazzling speeches and basically nobody could defeat his charm, deep inside he was having trouble being authentic. He said he felt as if it was all a show, a performance. He was only feeding his ego and nothing else. Conceit, self-glory, no ikhlas. One day he goes to the madrasa for a lecture and just could not utter a single word. He tried and tried again but no words would come out of his mouth. He mentions in his autobiography that he had intended to mend his ways for so long. He wanted to quit the life of being a rock star, if you will, but could never do it. Ultimately, it was God who helped him out. It was this sheer calamity which led him to the long-sought seclusion of the necessary detachment he needed. And one day, just like that, he left it all, quit his job at the height of his career in Baghdad and left the prestigious Nizamiya Madrasa and took off. How could you do that? You're at the top. You have made it, yeah, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. But only Abu Hamid al-Ghazali knew what was going on with him internally. So he left on a journey to nowhere. For the next 10 years, he wandered between Mecca, Damascus, and Jerusalem, living in total state of abasement. He actually became a janitor at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. So Imam al-Ghazali used to sweep the mosque. And then he was given a room there where he spent his time in seclusion and also to write. But literally nobody knew he was. Well, they were actually teaching his books at the madrasa in Damascus. Many years later, however, he makes a solid comeback as a Sufi, but we shall come back to that later. Al-Jubaini al-Ghazali's teacher had been the head of the Nizamiya of Nishapur until his death in 1085. The responsibility fell over al-Ghazali's shoulder and for the next five years he performed his duties impeccably. A born curious, al-Ghazali played the skepticism game to the fullest. His big thing was the quest for a certain knowledge, which he defines as that knowledge in which the object is known in a manner which is not open to doubt at all, so that if its truth were to be challenged by a miracle maker, it would withstand the challenge. The best he could find, however, was via sense knowledge and self-evident propositions. Knowledge from these sources is not bulletproof. Only these four types of learned people can possess the knowledge he needed. The theologians, the Ismaili esoterics, the philosophers, and the Sufis. The primary aim of theology or Kalam, he argues, was the defense of orthodoxy and to counterattack the heretics. The theologians hardly really know what they're talking about, but accept it on account of scriptural authority. No certitude to be found here. The Ismaili doctrine known as Talim did not quench his thirst for truth either. They claim that no knowledge of truth can be possible without a teacher or an imam. Their imam is infallible. But Muslims already do have an infallible imam, namely the Prophet, whose infallibility is proven. All in all, the Talim did not impress him much. When it comes to philosophy, Ghazali tells us in his autobiography that it took him merely three years with God's assistance to master the philosophical sciences completely. He goes on to write his notable book on philosophy known as The Intentions of the Philosophers. Everyone accepts that this man totally understood philosophy and Muslim Neoplatonism. Then drops the bombshell al tahaf of the philosopher or the incoherence of the philosophers where he systematically decimates Islamic Neoplatonism and takes the likes of Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi to the cleaners. It is important to emphasize here that Ghazali did not hate philosophy. He did not claim that it was false, useless or spurious. He was simply pointing out that within the realm of Islamic theology some philosophers who are so admired for their knowledge and wisdom have dealt some devastating blows to philosophy itself by being short-sighted and too free a thinkers. Their Neoplatonism needs to be curbed. In the incoherence of the philosopher, Ghazali raises 20 objections against the philosophers. However, for brevity's sake, we'll only briefly discuss the three most important ones. And these three points are the ones where he is criticized to be overly antagonistic, going as far as calling Ibn Sina and the peers 
disbelievers. In his rebuttal of the eternalist thesis, Al-Ghazali asserts that the world was created in time through an eternal decree of God. He rejects in this connection the claim that the lapse of time which separates the eternal decree of God and creation of the world involves the supposition that God could not accomplish the creation at once. This claim he argues does not rest on any demonstrative ground but is simply a dogmatic assertion. Mathematically speaking, eternal world entails an infinite time has passed since its creation. Infinity does not exist in real life. We can count the revolutions of the planets if we wanted to. That would be a demonstrable fact. The revolutions would also be even or odd. There's no even or odd infinity. The world therefore is hadith or created. On God's knowledge of the particulars, Ghazali argues that this claim is indirect conflict with Quranic teachings. The Quran itself has stated in numerous passages that not a single atom's weight in the heavens or on earth is hidden from him. On the matter of soul's immortality and bodily resurrection, Ghazali criticizes Avicenna's lack of proof for his argument. Only scripture gives us the knowledge. He says that we don't have to look for a reason. Similarly, pleasure or pain of the afterlife can logically be attributed to a body and not just soul. Ghazali bringing about an end to the age of reason and philosophical progress and as a result the Islamic golden age is as ridiculous a saying as that Ottomans banned the printing press because it was haram. His intellectual journey came to an impasse. He didn't know what to believe. He didn't know whether he could indeed find the knowledge which is beyond any doubt. When it came to the Sufis, however, he couldn't refute them using his rational tools. Sufis never claimed any logical grounds. Therefore, one had to experience the psychology, the behavioral side of things, the consciousness itself. But it's a science. It can be replicated. Anyone can do it. Here's a map. Get a guide and everyone who follows will have more or less the same journey in a reachable destination. The Hafid al philosopher didn't really shake the core of Islamic philosophy. It didn't do that. What actually depopularized falsafa was Ghazali's crisis and his own solution to it. So the Hujat al-Islam himself couldn't really find the answers and solutions to his problem in philosophy and kalam and reason pretty much failed him. And why should we as regular folks look up to philosophy and search for those answers? Why shouldn't we directly go to Sufism, which was his solution to the problem? Why shouldn't we just go straight to the right path? But Sufism did not start with Al-Ghazali. A new current of love for poverty, abstinence and devotional piety started at Basra and drew many followers. The leader of the ascetics or the lamp of Basra, Hasan al-Basri was a second generation Muslim who are known as the Tabi'un. Born and grew up in Medina, after the Battle of Safin, his family moved to Basra. Al-Basri's notion of the religious life fundamentally revolved around ascetism, where piety poverty and a disdain for material possessions were the fundamental components. The conflict between the divine will and human will can be reconciled by reflection or fikr, self-examination, muhasaba, leading up to inner contentment which the worldly pleasures and pursuits can never provide. Hassan was often seen weeping while praying and during remembrance of God. One particular tradition relates that he wept so much praying on his rooftop one day that his abundant tears began to run off through the downspouts upon a passerby who inquired whether the water was clean. Hassan immediately called out to the man below, telling him it was not, for these were sinner's tears. The city of Basra saw another personality who became one of the most central figures of early Muslim Sufis. Rabia al adawiya also known as Rabia Basri, was a saint and Sufi mystic of the 8th century as well. She promoted the idea of loving God for being God and not for any rewards. She writes, O Lord, if I worship you because of fear of hell, then burn me in hell. If I worship you because I desire paradise, then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for you yourself alone, then deny me not your eternal beauty. She was the first one to set forth the doctrine of divine love known as Ishki Hakiki. No one prior to her had written so passionately about love of God. In this context, she diverged from the entire religious tradition within Islam. Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi was born in 830 CE in Baghdad and is said to have Persian ancestry. 
He's one of the most revered figures in Sufism, acknowledged in works like Kashf al-Mahjoob by Ali Ashwari and Ihya al-Mutin by Ghazali. Ghazali, in fact, mentions Junaid as one of his prime spiritual masters. Every Sufi order to this day mostly draws its lineage from this particular Sufi. Junaid's significance lies in the early recognition of the dangers in Sufism, emphasizing adherence to the Quran and traditions strictly. He had made clear very early that Quran and the traditions define the way of the Sufi and nothing else. Sufism for Junaid stems from human beings yearning for the creator rooted in God's pre-worldly oath or covenant. God took an oath from all of his creation prior to this world of our bodily existence. Returning to the primordial existence means the Shahada transforms from a servant's testimony to God's testimony through his servant. The individual's dual existence, eternal divine form within Allah and temporary physical form in this world is interestingly aligned with Plotinus's view. Al-Fana means destroyed, perished, annihilated and disappeared. Misak and Fana employ different approaches to achieve Tawheed. Misak restates the primordial condition of a servant while Fana explains the method, training and steps towards the primordial condition. A tawheed of a true muwahid is when he becomes immortal through the immortality of God, although at the exact time he also ceases to exist. In this condition you are you, and at the same time you are no longer you. You become immortal the moment you cease to exist. Therefore, Fana is enshrouded by Baqa or the immortality of God. Fana and Baqa are the same condition from two different aspects. When a person has achieved a complete fana, then he becomes immortal in God. It is tough to ignore that right about the time of Junaid, foreign pantheistic elements began to infiltrate or influence Islamic Sufism, especially with the idea of self-annihilation and the longing to become one with God. The historian Majid Fakhri also alludes to influences from Hinduism. According to him, Plotinus was deeply influenced by Hindu and Persian philosophy and also studied these languages. Therefore, perhaps the eventual culmination of such foreign ideas isn't foreign at all. It was only a matter of time. And maybe calling it foreign is not right to begin with. It's perhaps the natural diversity whenever something grows and multiplies, cultures begin to engulf inside of it. Some early Sufis, without going to the lengths to which later Sufis did, clearly regarded Muhammad's role as mediator between God and man as somewhat secondary. Asked by the Prophet in a dream, Do you love me? Rabia is said to have replied, O oh, Apostle of God, is there anyone who does not love thee? My love of God Almighty, however, has filled my heart to such an extent that there is no room left in it for the love or hate of anyone else. Now, while many of the earliest Sufis remained within the confines of the Sharia and had their tendencies to enter into the universe of pantheism curb, some of the later wild ones, however, could not handle the temptation and the intoxication got the better of them. If they could reinterpret the scripture and the sayings of the Prophet, if they could circumvent marriage and legitimize celibacy, then they could also bypass Muhammad as the primary link between man and God. Figures such as Al-Bustami, and Al-Hallaj come to mind. Some call him Sultan Al-Arifin. Others label him as the founder of the drunken or intoxicated school of mysticism. He was introduced to Sufism by an Indian convert to Islam, Abu Ali Sindhi, who taught Al-Bistami the doctrine of extinction in unity or Fana Fitawheed. There are clear indications, as many historians say, of Hindu Vedantic metaphysics here, especially the nihilistic undertones. Bastami put himself through the most stringent of Sufi regiments to harness love of God, to strip himself of his human essence completely and utterly. In his pursuit, he is observed to often extravagate and take some liberties, which can be deemed controversial to say the least. In one of his leaps towards the divine, he utters, Subhani, Ma'azam, Shani, Glory be to me. How great I am. But apparently it was God himself speaking through Bayezid's Bustami's mouth and not himself. In another one of his ecstatic utterances, or Shatahat as they call it, he says, There is nothing inside this cloak except Allah. And what is this fire? I will lean on it tomorrow and say, Make me a sacrifice for its people, otherwise I am going to swallow it. And what is paradise? It's a children's game and the desire of the people of this world. In another one of his assertions, he says, 
Who do these hadith scholars think they are? If a man narrated to another man, our heart has narrated to us from the Lord. When he was reprimanded over his lack of praying and other rituals, he resorted to pleading not guilty by reason of insanity and got away with it. So much so that later in time, the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah accepted that. When Bayezid Bustami passed away, he was 74 years old. Someone asked him his age on his deathbed. He said, I am four years old. For 70 years, I was failed. I got rid of my wheels only four years ago. Mansur al-Halaj was a student of Junaid al-Baghdadi and as a matter of fact, it was Junaid who had given Halaj his Suf. Suf. You know, the garb that Sufis wear. The reason why they're called Sufis. Anyway, so after some time, Junaid could see clearly hints of mad flamboyance in Halaj, if you will, and eventually broke up with him on account of sheer crazy. Halaj was a little bit too much of a Sufi. He was out Sufiing the Sufis. During his first Hajj, for example, he confined himself to one place inside the hall for a whole year. Didn't even sleep, just like dozed off for a while to standing or squatting. I saw my Lord with the eyes of the heart, I asked. Who are you? He replied. You, declared himself a Shia on and off. Didn't really think at his level he was required to offer prayers. Also started to claim he had become one with God. It is said that Halaj visited Junaid at his abode and knocked on the door. Junaid asked, who is there? And Halaj replied, Anal Haq, I am the truth. According to him, the essence of union with God or Ayn al-Ajm was different from that of al-Bustami as he did not annihilate himself but rather manifested in the form of enormous bliss and intimate joy. After breaking ties with Junaid, he became a preacher and preached all sorts of fringe and fleshy stuff. To some he became a mentor and a great sage, to others a heretic and a transgressor. He also publicly showed his reverence for Imam Humble. Perhaps it was the streak of rebellion within him which made him identify with Ibn Humble because apart from that there was absolutely nothing that they had in common. In one of his speeches he himself had declared that it's imminent that he's going to get executed and it's going to be merited. He was eventually arrested on charges of being an Ismaili terrorist and put behind bars or in a dungeon facility for nine years. Eventually, on account of heresy, he was then sentenced to death. He also denied the charges and claimed nothing he had ever said constitutes heresy as he had been within the confines of standard Sufism. His accusers, however, did not agree and amongst those was the vizier of the time. Halaj was sentenced to be whipped and, you know, standard decapitation. However, for good measure and for spectacle's sake, as a thousand witnessed his execution on the banks of Tigris, the vizier cracked it up a notch and had him whipped, mutilated, crucified, decapitated, cremated, and his ashes were scattered in the river. If there was anyone who should have been pardoned on account of insanity, perhaps it should have been Halaj. It baffles me still, and in a pleasant way, that even hardliners such as Ibn Taymiyyah were very lenient and considerate towards Halaj's condition. To Halaj, perhaps, expressing his madness was the very act of defiance, which was similar to what Ahmed bin Hanbal had shown to the Mu'tazila. Killing Halaj did not kill Sufism. The execution of Halaj, however, marked a pivotal point in the history of Sufism as it was acknowledged that the framework must include Sharia as well as the Prophet's linkage as a mandatory factor. Many things, orthodox, creative, and even at times heretic, could be infused with the Sufi framework, but in a smart way. The Sufi ideas started to become more and more complex for an average Muslim to even comprehend the club started to become more and more exclusive. The Zahiri school of thought saw a surprising revival in Andalusia after it had pretty much petered out in the Middle East. Ibn Hazm single-handedly revived this literalist interpretation of the scripture by keeping it rather simple. He's like, y'all heretics, Mu'tazilites, Asherites, Sufis, whatever, whatever. As long as you use an logical reasoning or qiyas, you do taqlid or you have any sort of a preference for one school of thought over another, use causal interpretation or what is known as talil, or rely on ijma or consensus over complex matters. The only persons who were allowed to do consensus or ijma were the companions of the prophets and nobody else is allowed to do that. And pretty much all this scholastic theology is basically mumbo-jumbo because 
Nobody as a human being can reach the rationale of God. His attributes, his names, where does he reside? Is his throne on water? What is his throne made up of? Does he have hands or does he speak? All of this is just beyond our understanding. So it's just futile even trying to understand God's ways. After a decade of living as a nobody, Ghazali sightings started to be observed across his native city of Tus. He was invited to resume his position in Baghdad, which he gleefully declined and opted to live a life of seclusion, remembrance of God, and of course, writing. He had come back as a Sufi. Ghazali's formulation of Sufism was successful because it was fully compatible with the orthodoxy. However, his concept of mystical hierarchy of being is surprisingly Neoplatonic. This was later criticized vehemently by Ibn Rushd, and rightly so, since Ghazali's project had been against Neoplatonism. Hold on, did you really think we were done with Neoplatonism? Yeah, not gonna happen. Ghazali 2.0 is an interesting character, as interesting as Ghazali 1.0. However, perhaps not as serrated. He is observed in his later writings to have become very less harsh in his judgment and much more tolerant in entertaining differing views. So much so that he became lenient towards those who did not share his ideas pertaining to the pre-eternity of the world, those such as Ibn Sina and Farabi, whom he had declared heretics and kafirs in Tahafat. The Sufi Ghazali was only interested in the fundamental doctrines of Islam now, such as oneness of God, the prophethood of Muhammad, and the afterlife. All the other beliefs and even innovative practices, he said, should be tolerated and no one should be labeled as unbeliever willy-nilly. His Sufi concepts, which are indeed Neoplatonic, but have roots in Quran and Ahadi. According to the Quran, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Therefore, the more an entity is closer to the Almighty, the more illuminated it is going to be. The only true being is God alone by the way of emanation. All other entities receive their being, but only in a derivative manner. The highest form of knowledge is not that of reason and not that of faith either, but of direct experience. Reason, what aql works in correspondence with senses for normal people. However, for prophets and saints, a superpower faculty is given through which they can view what is to come and receive the knowledge of the divine. Ghazali further states that those who deny the existence of such beauty are akin to those who lack the sense of taste for music or poetry, therefore cannot comprehend these aesthetics. The Fatimids of Egypt had sent some Ismailis to India during the 10th century, which introduced Islamic philosophy to the region. Ghaznavi has put an end to the Ismaili rule, however, philosophy continued to thrive under their rule. One of the notable figures during that era was Abul Hassan al hajwari or Tata Ganj Baksh. Tata Ganj Baksh of Lahore was born in Ghazni in the year 2009 and traced back his lineage to Ali, the fourth rightly guided caliph of Islam. Ali Hajwari traveled widely and spent time in cities such as Damascus, Baghdad, and Nishapur. Author of one of the most widely read books on Sufism, Kashwal Majub, or Unveiling of the Hidden, is a monumental work of Sufi literature. Ali Ajwari's shrine, or Tata Tarpar, is one of the most visited Sufi shrines in the whole world. Kashwal Majub offers insights into the Sufi way by laying out the stages a Sufi must traverse in order to attain union with God. Ali Ajwari draws from his own personal experience, and lives of other revered saints is also documented throughout the book. Another Sufi stalwart of this era uh, was Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, also known as Oseyazm. Born in Iran in 1077, he became the founder of one of the most widely spread Sufi orders called Qadiriya. He's still considered to be handing out favors and bounties to those in need, albeit that is obviously controversial. Ibn Tufail was born in the city of Guadix near Granada in Andalusia. Grew up under the tutelage of Ibn Bajja to be a polymath because why not? Later on served as a court minister and also, of course, of course, a physician. The work he's most known for to this day is a short but monumental philosophical novel named Hayy ibn Yaqzan or Alive, Son of Awake, written sometime between 1169 to 1179. The story is set on a deserted island somewhere in the Indian Ocean and revolves around the life of a young boy named Hayy who is left to survive all by himself shortly after birth. Despite lacking human contact and societal influence, Hay's keen intellect allows him to learn about the world through observation and experimentation. 
the tale is so ahead of its time in terms of ideas that no other piece of literature comes close we get themes of reason versus faith the nature of knowledge spirituality environmentalism human nature importance of divine guidance and so forth even to fail remain in sultan's service until the latter's death in 1184 and survived him by one year dying in marrakesh in 1185 by the end of his life he appears to have abandoned all other interests in favor of prayer and meditation he was one of the most leading and most respected figures of his day and abu yaqub's son and successor mansur personally led the city in mourning before his death ibn tufail was responsible for attracting many scholars and learned individuals to the caliph's court one of those bright and young individuals was a man named abdul walid muhammad abdul walid muhammad ibn ahmad ibn rushd while ibn tufail was ibn tufailing in caliph's court a young ibn rushd came in for an interview now despite his underwhelming performance as far as the interview was concerned the young great however landed the job of qadi at the court of seville largely thanks to the keen foresight of ibn tufail after ibn tufail had excused himself of writing a commentary on aristotle ibn rushd was commissioned to write this work which became monumental to say the least a few years later Ibn Rushd succeeded the great Ibn Tufail as the chief physician of the court because everyone in those days just had to be a doctor. Ibn Rushd was born in Cordoba, Spain in 1126, following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather who both served as Maliki judges in Cordoba. The young Ibn Rushd received an education that encompassed studies in jurisprudence, Arabic literature, theology, philosophy, and medicine. Known as the commentator, Ibn Rushd's project was essentially to defend his teacher Aristotle, so he mounted charges on Islamic philosophers on account of either misunderstanding Aristotle or deliberately distorting his true teachings. We have seen that during the translation movement of the 9th century, numerous important works which became the bedrock of Muslim understanding of Aristotle were in fact not Aristotle's works. Moreover, they had conflated Plato and Aristotle as if their teachings were the same. Philosophy in the Islamic world, at least for the masses, did take a blow by Al-Ghazali and to some degree was still recovering from it. Ibn Rushd, however, was not taking any of it as he came out guns blazing and wrote one of his most important works called The Hafut, The Hafut or The Incoherence of the Incoherence. For Ibn Rushd, philosophy is not out of line at all. Ghazali's conclusion about philosophy is, especially his takfir of Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi. In other words, his charges of unbelief towards these philosophers. It is important to revisit how the Muslim philosophy had sort of moved on from Aristotle or pseudo-Aristotelian philosophy to Ibn Sina, as if Ibn Sina is the philosopher who best represents philosophy. To Ibn Rushd, that whole enterprise is spurious. Ibn Sina isn't what philosophy is all about. Aristotle is. Therefore, Ghazali's criticism of Ibn Sina isn't a criticism of philosophy itself. In terms of his critique of Al-Ghazali in Tahafut, let us observe his views over the three major points which to Al-Ghazali qualified as not heresy but downright unbelief. Ibn Rushd was a staunch Aristotelian, in case you didn't know that. Still, Aristotle denied the creation of the world ex nihilo, therefore Ibn Rushd also denied it. So Al-Ghazali's takfir also accurately applies to Ibn Rushd as much as it did to Ibn Sina and Farabi. So how does Ibn Rushd respond? Well, out of nothing, he says, comes nothing. The idea that there was pre-existing matter out of which the universe was created is not an idea plucked from thin air. The Quran mentions, and he it is who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And before that, his throne was upon the water that he may test you. Who of you is better in conduct? In another verse of the Quran, the following can be found. Then he turned towards the heavens when it was still like smoke, saying to it and to the earth, submit willingly or unwillingly. They both responded, we submit willingly. So we can see the point of contention here. If there was indeed God's throne upon water prior to the creation of the world and there was also smoke, it only goes out to show that the concept of pre-existing material isn't completely far-fetched. In the coherence of the coherence, Ibn Rushd points to these verses and argues that they are open to interpretation. This interpretation, as already mentioned, is the business of the philosophers alone because they alone 
are able to apply the method of logical demonstration or burhan unlike the theologians and the masses at large who are only able to apply the inferior methods of dialectic or rhetoric respectively as for god's knowledge of particulars on which al ghazali's second major criticism of the philosophers turned ibn rushd explains that the philosophers do not deny that god knows the multitude of created particulars but only his mode of knowledge is analogous to ours they maintain instead that god's knowledge is the cause of these particulars whereas ours is the effect of the objects known or the maloom in other words in the very act of knowing them god causes them to come into being while our own knowledge is dependent upon their coming into being and is conditioned by it in the matter of pertaining to the bodily resurrection of human beings even rushd argues that both theologians and philosophers believe in resurrection the only difference between the philosophers and the theologians on this score is that the mode of resurrection favored by each group is different the philosophers for their part favor spiritual resurrection mad rohani whereas the theologians favor bodily resurrection with respect to the fact of resurrection both groups are in agreement the three points of takfir raised by ghazali are thus tackled by ibn rushd and he further claims that they are only a matter of interpretation and semantics ghazali should have just kept his guns in his holster instead of firing unbelief on fellow muslims just like that Ibn Rush further lays out his defense of philosophy by arguing that the knowledge of philosophy is not only permitted not even just good but in fact is required to have at least for those who have the talent for it he mentions verses from Quran which urges human beings to give thought to the creation of heavens and the earth and contemplate the realm of heavens and the earth and all that Allah has created in fact god himself says that he will place defilement upon those who will not use reason Like Plato, Averroes accords to women an equal share in the management of the affairs of the state. He writes that women, insofar as they are of one kind with men, necessarily share in the end of man. They will differ only in less or more, that is, in degree. Hence, they should be allowed to engage in warfare with men, as was the case with Bedouin women in pre-Islamic times. It is even possible for women to rise to the rank of philosophers and rulers, according to Averroes. Ibn Rushd despite being an indomitable figure in Islamic philosophy wasn't much of an influence during his time at least in the Islamic world him being one of the reasons of European enlightenment is undoubtedly heralded now he had to face all sorts of criticism during his life and posthumously too he was called a mere imitator of Aristotle by the mystic Ibn Sabin Ibn Taymiyyah the massively influential theologian which we shall introduce later lambasted even rush rationalism and bombarded all sorts of names and titles on it ignorance leads to fear fear leads to hatred and hatred leads to violence this is the equation Burdened under suspected charges of heresy as he fell out of caliph's favor, Ibn Rushd was exiled to a Jewish village outside of Cordoba in 1195. The reasons, as they usually are, seem more political than religious. He was not the favorite amongst the circles of Mutakallimun, oh, I wonder why. The exile, however, was canceled eventually for some reason his job was restored as well. Ibn Rushd died a few years later in 1198. relatively modern times he has become somewhat of a revivalist icon the voice of reason although i believe people who do take comfort in his methods aren't usually as smart as him in terms of a holistic understanding of sharia now ibn rushd had a friend named ali ibn muhammad who had brought his young son to meet the great qadi of cordoba upon their arrival ibn rushd got up to greet them and when he met the youth he said yes as if to communicate that he had understood the young boy The young boy on the other hand clearly wanting to convey that he in fact hadn't said no a worried ibn rushd flinched upon realizing that he might have misunderstood the youth and asked what solution have you found as a result of mystical illumination and divine inspiration does it coincide with what is arrived at by speculative thought the youth replied yes and no between the yea and the nay the spirits take their flight beyond matter and the next detached themselves from their bodies at this ibn rushd became pale and trembled as he muttered there is no power save from god this was because he had truly understood what the young boy was alluding to